I'm going to go ahead and get started. So good morning, everyone. We are really excited for you to uh, join us on this uh, bright Friday morning. Really appreciate you guys taking the time out. Um, as Ferelli continues to uh, provide as much uh, topical and timely information, we are moving into a roundtable series uh, that we're going to start this week with the private uh, colleges and universities. Uh, and we are excited to have Carol Thomas hosting. Um, and she'll be walking through some of the panelists and they'll go through their introductions and uh, provide a lot of great content. So we're really excited to have you with us this morning. Uh, before we get started, wanted to talk a little bit about um, how things will play out uh, for the next hour or so. Uh, we have asked everyone to remain on mute to keep down on background noise. So you should have already been muted. Um, from there, if you have any questions, there is a chat button. I know some people are using Teams, some are very familiar with Zoom, but there is a chat button at the bottom. Uh, if you click the icon, and it'll bring up a window. Please feel free to put any questions in there uh, throughout the hour. Uh, and once you do that, either, you know, we'll be able to uh, kind of real time answer that question, or, uh, you know, we are trying to leave some time uh, for questions at the end that we can go back to. And I will also commit that uh, if we don't get to your question, we will certainly do something written uh, directly. So no question will go unanswered. Uh, but certainly uh, want to make sure that you feel like you are you know able to participate in that form or fashion so definitely put those there we are also recording the webinar and from there you will be able to kind of go back and reference the conversation and dialogue and if you have any other questions you could always reach out uh, to anyone at Ferelli uh, and we can get you connected if it's you know something with one of the panelists as well all right and from there I want to turn it over to Carol Thomas Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining this uh, CIO roundtable this morning. Um, as Stephen said, I'm Carol Thomas. I'm Senior Vice President of Professional Services at Ferelli, and one of my areas of responsibility is our leadership practice. So I'm really delighted that we are able to offer this uh, first in what will be a series of virtual roundtables uh, to support conversations on important topics for our profession. Today, we've gathered uh, university leaders to have a conversation about how they and their institutions are responding to the unprecedented, unprecedented challenges in the world today. Um, as we consider the past, and as I was sitting here thinking about, in, in February I was the sitting CIO and in March I was not, I was with Ferelli and the world was changing rapidly around me and I was admiring the responses of my colleagues, uh, both at the institution I'd served, but also in the, in the larger world as we considered how we would respond in what has become the present or the new normal. Uh, the uncertainties of the environment are challenging us as innovators and leaders. And as we think about the future, we know we are unlikely ever to return to what it was like even a few short weeks ago. For some of us, that's a positive statement. For others, it's a more challenging statement. So today we have opportunities to work together in new and unique ways with collaboration and support never more important. So thank you all for participating today in what will continue to be important conversations about navigating these times. Our contributors have much to share and I've left time for each of them to introduce themselves, the, the uh, institutions that they serve and share on some of these uh, important uh, topics. So I'd like to turn the conversation over to them and I'd like to start with uh, Joseph Hemway from Pratt. Joe? Good morning, everyone. That was a success so far. I started speaking after I unmuted myself. Um, Joe Hemway, I've been at uh, Pratt Institute for about 14 years. Uh, Pratt is in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, it's a art design and architecture school. We also have an information, a school of information. Um, it's, you know, I'm sure each of us could uh, fill a volume uh, or two with what has gone on uh in in this time um but uh it's we're, we're probably like a lot of you we face the same challenges and uh it was uh as as the crisis unfolded we had to keep iterating and iterating and iterating and um carol do you want me to just jump right into the uh the um you know kind of the, the initial parts of the yes, question please. yeah okay mm -hmm. great um, so 
because we're uh, we have a, a heavy emphasis on material practices, uh, design studios. Um, we have you know wood shops, metal shops, uh, jewelry studios. It presented a significant challenge for us, and we had to sort of solve that as we went along. But the fortunate part was that we had a good portion of the semester underway, so we started to accelerate some of those materials practices classes, and then you know went uh, online the rest of the way. Um, overall, the institute had a uh, we have a continuity of operations uh, plan, and um, we went by that plan. Uh, we were fortunate to have it. Um, and everything worked exactly as we planned for. Um, and in case nobody's lied to you today, that's the first lie of the day. Is that the, the minute it, uh, it took place, the, the plan went left, right. We kept readjusting and pivoting. Um, we still are. And um, the continuity of operations plan and the business continuity planning has sort of been our roadmap now back to try to remobilize onto campus. Um, so it's not as simple as you all know as reversing everything. Um, but I think the biggest thing we found in going through that effort to follow a plan and to uh, get a remote workforce going to complete the semester, et cetera, I think the overarching thing that I found is we had to be able to drift through the org chart the hierarchical structure of an org chart just wasn't going to cut it for this type of situation. And before long, we realized that we had to create multiple agile teams and even agile teams within the agile teams based on people's expertise. Um, so we had to suspend and break the org chart a little bit. And just, that takes a certain amount of faith and you have to let go of egos uh, pretty much because you're you're used to supervising people when you're earthbound and you're used to having strict divisions. Um, and this was an opportunity for us to, to put that to the test. Um, one of the biggest challenges was uh, we are about a third international. So we had to deal with not only getting everybody out of the dorms, but we had to get people uh, back to their homes all over the world. We also have an extensive study abroad uh, uh, component and we had to get those students uh, back to us and then somehow complete the semester that was already underway uh, in other countries. Um, so um, it all in all it was uh, you know it was just a steady uh, march toward getting the semester completed getting um, we quickly put together a telepresence site that aggregated all of the tools that we had, you know, LMS, ePortfolio, um, all the video tools, lecture capture, and so on. So we had that with, uh, which pretty much went up over a weekend, um, along with a number of, uh, you know, guides, how-tos, you know, pedagogical uh, materials that people could turn to. And we took every department within my division <clears throat> and we, uh, we use Salesforce for our, uh, uh, our tech desk support center, um, and we uh, put up their omni-channel um, uh, uh, support uh, module um, pretty much overnight if we had to. And so I took everybody that was not anchored towards something uh, like a critical piece of infrastructure, and they became support center staff. And we developed a call center that ran uh, is still running 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. seven days to deal with uh, all of the faculty calls, all the student calls. We're just finishing, so um, we've then taken that data and we're starting to mine that data for you know commonalities and so forth. Um, so, in terms of what the next few months look like, it's you know of course it's anybody's guess as to how we go back, um, but we're preparing for it. Uh, the, you know, the extreme case being completely online. We've um, prepared uh, a remote lab setup. We use a lot of design software. So we just completed a remote lab setup on um, AWS. And so we're now at a point where, because of the unevenness of the machines that the students and the faculty have, we're able to use that uh, uh, remote setup on the thinnest possible platform. We actually yesterday got it to work off of a Raspberry Pi. So we're we're like actually having people producing things 
um, using a Raspberry Pi. Um, we have a lot of production output. We do uh, extensive 2D printing, uh, everything from fabric printing to photo. So uh, in addition to 3D printing and milling, so we're working out ways that we could deliver that through UPS um, as the students produce their materials. And if we are fortunate enough to be uh, back, but practicing social distancing, looking at uh, an Amazon locker type setup for uh, pickups, we could cut down on the density within the labs and the uh, um, uh, the output centers. So um, I don't want to take up too much time. So I I just that's sort of things in a nutshell. So. Well, that's a lot, Joe, and I really appreciate that because you've got some pretty unique challenges given the kind of education that you deliver. And so it's really interesting to hear how you're accommodating um, those adjustments uh, through through really, uh, really interesting approaches. I appreciate that. I um, uh, know we'll have a chance to circle back uh, shortly, but I'd like to move on then to Carolyn Weaver from Des Moines. Carolyn, eager to hear what you have to, to say about your institution. I'm muted. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we at DMU are a health sciences university in Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, we have eight health-related degree programs, including a DO, Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine program, PA, PT, etc. Um, in about mid-March, we um, we were anticipating having to move to remote work and mobilized our team um, to get some tools together for um, online teaching and online uh, remote exam proctoring. Um, we developed uh, you know, a website with information for faculty and students to about conducting synchronous and asynchronous uh, uh, learning sessions, um, rapidly trained faculty who were not familiar with using Zoom. So we have some of our programs, the faculty were used to going into a lecture hall and some, sometimes students, many, many students would be there, sometimes just a few students, and they all of their lectures were recorded, so they were kind of used to that, but they were not used to synchronous learning, and so we worked rapidly to transition them to being able to do synchronous learning, and um, uh, had some, some fits and starts with remote exam proctoring. Of course, you can imagine we have a very high stakes environment, and uh, people are very concerned about cheating. Uh, and so um, we were able though to get some free licensing. Of course, we were inundated with all of the vendors basically offering assistance and providing free licensing. So um, for example, Respondus gave us free licenses for Respondus Monitor and uh, we were able to do some um, mock exams for our students rapidly to get that going and that went really really well um, and we rolled out vpn really quickly so that um, our faculty and staff could work remotely uh, we ended up having to implement telehealth services in our clinic and our student counseling center. Um, one of the big problems that we had for our students had to do with clinical rotations. So at one point, um, the students were being sent home and told that they couldn't continue their clinical rotations. And we were very concerned that they weren't going to be able to graduate and um, our programs motivated and found um, several online tools that provided the curriculum for the students and worked with our accreditors to allow those tools to be used for our clinical rotations. So um, that put an incredible strain on our, on our IT staff, of course, but I was really, really impressed with the IT team with my team and very um, 
happy to see how tolerant our faculty and staff were through this whole thing. I mean, I just would call it great resilience and um, ability that I didn't know was there because they're, the, like I said, it's a very high stakes environment. And so people want things to work and they expect things to work. And now they were thrown into a situation where they didn't know things, where they where things didn't work all the time and they had to be flexible and they did that. And it was phenomenal and I think will be a great lesson for them for the future that you know things don't have to be perfect and they don't always work and we have to be flexible and figure out how to make it work. So um, we also did end up canceling our graduation as most of you probably have. We did pivot to a virtual graduation that's gonna be happening this Friday. And a lot of that is pre-recorded. The students submitted pictures of themselves. And so we'll see how that, that comes out. Um, our emergency response team is a small team consisting of me and uh, the chief marketing officer, the chief compliance officer, um, the president, the chief financial officer. And right now we're in the midst of re-entry planning. We have a dashboard that we are using to determine when we return to campus. It's, um, it has probably less than 10 items that we're looking at some of them are internal things that we need to do before we can allow more people to come on campus because we actually are not closed, uh, but we just don't have very many people coming to campus. Um, our initial re-entry would be a 25% target of people returning and we're considering June, although we have to make a final decision on that. Iowa is reopening today. Um, I personally am very nervous about all of that. Um, but at the same time, um, having this dashboard where we can review, are we having, do we have reduced deaths in the area? Do we have hospital capacity in the area? Do we have you know, reduced cases in the area? Um, all of those things are things we're looking at. Um, Sounds like you're doing a, a remarkable job in the face of a, uh, again, curricular challenges, educational delivery challenges around, as you've pointed out, a very high stakes, uh, high stakes operation. Really uh, remarkable, remarkable work. And I've heard similar things about the agility and flexibility and responsiveness of colleagues throughout an institution and across institutions to support this. Uh, very unusual time, and like you, I think the future uh, is brighter for that for that learning that we've we've accomplished in the middle of this difficult time. Thank Definitely. you, Carolyn. I'd like. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like. You're welcome, and I will be circling back. I'm sure. I'd like to move on to Brandon, Brandon Gacky from uh, Pacific University. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, Hi, Brandon. Brandon. Gacky. Hello, um, Brandon Gacky in Pacific University, over located in Oregon. And my compliments to those that have already spoken because we're in a very similar boat. Pacific University is 50% of our 4,000 students are undergraduate liberal arts and the other 50% are in kind of professional health degrees, you know, PA, optometry and a variety of other mixes. So we've experienced very similar challenges. One of the most impressive things, I've only been at Pacific for the last six months. So I was there for three months before this all hit and uh, surprise, here we, here we roll. And it was amazing to see the turnaround. Within three weeks, we mobilized 4,000 students and about 1,500 faculty to go online. So we, that was done through a lot of the similar accommodations that you've heard, prioritizing uh, task force, you know, breaking out the decision making. And what was really great is the focus was get students graduated, focus on the students right behind them and enable anything and everything you need to do for everybody that supports and teaches those students. I mean, it seems simple, but when you, when you have so many moving pieces and everybody was trying to figure out who's in charge, what's happening, when those clear directives came out, boom, it, it amazingly helped us pivot. We, within 
one day purchased an enterprise license for Zoom. And why was that, why did that matter? So Zoom was a big deal for us. We had partially rolled it out, but people were still using free accounts and being stuck at that 40 minute limit. What we did is we eliminated the faculty anxiety about trying to deal with a 40 minute limit. It just bought blanket licenses for everybody. And we also instituted a protected data Zoom for the healthcare side. And we were spinning up policies, spinning up telehealth options, just you know, in parallel as quickly as possible. And it was amazing how flexible everybody was. So I wanted to applaud that really I'm coming into a new organization and still learning the house and boom, they were, they were like, what do we need to do to succeed? And we, after establishing the COVID task force, the other carrier was we had a digital divide. Even though we're a great university, you know, Highland, 30% of our population is first gen students. And many of them didn't have reliable access to technology. So this will probably be a similar theme to the community college, but we were going into our uh, recycle pile of things that we were looking to get rid of for computers and they were still serviceable, still received security updates. And we started imaging and handing out dozens and dozens and dozens of laptops, Wi-Fi hotspots, ways to track those so we could help students still maintain some form of connectivity. Because we went from about 1500 people living on campus, the rest were all commuting, to about 125. So everybody dispersed over spring break and did not come back. And many of them we were noticing were not responding in a timely fashion it's because they didn't have reliable access to internet or to computer. So we were able to help bridge that digital divide. That was a big deal for us. Uh, additionally, you know, similar to Carolyn and, um, you know, Des Moines, it, those clinical rotations just killed us. You know, we, all of our students being kicked out of the, the, the programs, bringing back, we had international placements as well. And we had to get real creative real fast with some online tools. We did additional community outreach as well to figure out how can we get these students continued. The, the online proctored exams, we got a little creative. There's something called Lockdown Browser. I don't know what that is, but I've got really smart people that work for me that are awesome. They utilize Lockdown Browser while still allowing Zoom to run and like all of these weird technical mumbo jumbos to really create an environment that was quick and dirty because we have exam soft, but it's not fully rolled out to all of our different colleges at our university. So online proctoring was a, a big deal. From the service desk side, we pivoted on a dime. We have about 70 student workers and about 50 of them stayed with us working remotely. So we extended our service hours very similar at uh, Pratt University. We went from eight to 11 every day, even on weekends. And we had extended hours. We had student workers covering the evening hours and we had one employee who could supervise. We had an open Zoom session all the time. Uh, we have had a few Zoom bombing uh, incidents, so uh, our security and our training of our faculty and all of our online systems continues to evolve. And it hasn't been very bad, but one was during senior presentation day, and that was very disappointing because, uh, yeah. Um, that, so security has been a big moment. My other title is CISO, so I have to wear that hat on top of it. So there's a big security component, you know, the HIPAA and the FERPA side. We were very fortunate that we had many of our different disparate groups we were trying to run it through our task force, but we had some groups that were trying to sprint before they even knew how to crawl. And it was nice to try and be able to bring them back in. And some of our other more well-developed teams, like our Student Counseling Center, very disciplined, ready, mission-driven. They pioneered how we were gonna use protected data Zoom. We even used something called Zoom Phone. Like we went through all of these different mitigation uh, technical components to figure out how can we serve the students where they are and what does that look like? And surprisingly, we were able to apply that same type of methodology to our other, we have about, we have optometry, we have PA, we have dental, we have all these weird, you know, medical programs and healthcare programs. And we were able to learn from our student counseling center what was gonna work pretty well. So we were able to apply that quickly and scale up in other groups. So I say that sharing of knowledge has been very good. Um, our finals just happened on Tuesday. So finals, finals was uh, an interesting one. Like everybody else, uh, we, basically canceled the entire campus. You know, both campuses were shut down. Everything was moved online. We did have, you know, only a few hundred, you know, like a hundred and some odd students that had nowhere to go. They stayed on campus. And so the impact to revenue has been substantial. We also rent out our campuses uh, during the summer months, during the lower, because hey, it's great money maker. We have this beautiful space, come here. 
And that has been, uh, you know, pivoting to nothing but online has seen that. We have begun the furlough, about 20% of our administrative staff, I mean, 20% for all of our administrative staff with some state assistance that Oregon is offering. And we are continually working with our accrediting bodies. You know, it's like, hey, can we do this? Does this count? Oh, no? Okay, well, what about this? And it's that constant engagement with our accrediting bodies. The next big thing that we're looking for is, all right, we've got our plans. We're getting our task force together. What does fall look like? Some are still going to be completely online. Great. It's that COVID-19 tracking and tracing. We are basically a small city like many of you are. What do we do once students come back, whatever social distancing is allowed, whatever thing is allowed, what do we do for that and how are we going to do it? So that's our big focus right now is partnering with other uh, West Coast colleges to try and take a similar approach, say, how are you tracking? What are you keeping an eye on? And all of those different pieces, because uh, it's going to depend county by county, state by state. So that's the next big right. thing as we reactivate. Well, thank you so much, Brandon. And your, your focus on sort of the iterative nature of this, I think Joe mentioned the same thing, sort of continuing to respond, revise, roll out something something new is, is a very important theme, I think, in all of this. And something we as technologists are well experienced at, but some of our colleagues maybe are not not so uh, not so experienced with. Really, thank you so much for that. Uh, I'd like to move on to uh, Christine Kurth. Christine? Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, the CIO at Ohio Dominican University, small private Catholic uh, school in Columbus, Ohio. Um, a lot of my experience has been very similar to what Carolyn and Brandon just described. Um, we have a graduate programs as well as undergraduate programs, uh, lots of healthcare and service related majors um, that have field experiences and clinicals and so on. Um, so we face some of those same challenges. Uh, I think that we were pretty fortunate to have had a number of things in place or on the cusp that allowed us to roll things out and get people working virtually pretty quickly um, without tons of sleepless nights. And I'm shocked at this because we have a very tiny IT department. Um, but we had just upgraded last year the virtual classroom feature in our LMS. We use Brightspace. Um, we have a, a great faculty services department and instructional designers who had already been working on um, using those features better as well as redesigning courses we already had planned in place, be redesigning courses before this happened, so they were really at the ready um, and had lots of documentation uh, for faculty to easily adjust. Uh, certainly we had a few faculty who, who didn't, but they were very, very small. Uh, very, very small indeed. So uh, I even had a number of faculty as they learned new features and tools, you know, not just the LMS and virtual classroom, but some of the other things. Uh, they contacted me and say, wow, you know, I, I didn't want to have to learn this, but now that I did, I've got these extra tools that I'm going to continue using even after this is over. Um, so getting faculty to actually admit that uh, was exciting for me. Um, we also had um, a pretty tight, uh, tightly controlled VPN set up. We had a number of staff who worked from home anyway. Um, so we had multi-factor authentication and the typical rollout was in for them to um, log into a remote server for VPN. So I, I'm holding my breath, but I feel pretty confident in terms of security risks uh, with the folks we had to move out. Um, we did have to uh, prepare a number of loaners for staff who didn't have computers, as well as some students. We do have a high percentage of first time students or students who are in uh, who are Pell uh, students. So um, we figured, well, since we don't we aren't using the classrooms right now. Uh, we just took a bunch of lab computers, uh, updated them a little bit as needed for remote, um, and handed those out. Um, so we're lucky we were able to turn that around pretty quickly. I think one of the biggest challenges was trying to get non-technical people comfortable with the technology. And I especially um, sensed a lot of pressure or felt a lot of pressure in doing this with my fellow cabinet members. Um, sadly, many of them are the worst when it comes to technology and they needed to be up and running virtually uh, very quickly. We did have, so we did um, increase our um, cabinet meetings. We also had a task force um, that has been meeting weekly 
uh, to talk about a lot of the different areas on campus, public safety, access to public areas, residence halls, health care, uh, and a number of those items. Um, I will say that this also has helped kind of escalate some um, initiatives that we already had either in a pilot way or that were we were right on the cusp of implementing. Um, for example, we in this past year um, had been piloting um, a hybrid classroom setup uh, where we have kind of a high powered camera to capture the classroom, um, uh, noise, really good noise canceling, um, speakerphone product, uh, and some additional tools within the LMS. Um, so we had six in the fall of these types of classrooms and with some of the CARES Act uh, funding, uh, we will be expanding that to 25 over the summer. Um, we figure we can do that whether the class is going to be hybrid or not, um, or um, if we are going to expand uh, additional class sizes. So we've had a group looking at the um, assessing the square footage of certain classrooms and then determining if we have a six foot radius around every person, how many people could we ideally fit in a classroom. So it may be a situation where we have a section of students meeting, but maybe across three classrooms. And so using some of that hybrid equipment will allow them to all be part of that same lecture. For those who want to be on campus, um, we do have a high uh, population of residents, students, and athletes, and international students. Uh, we still have about 20 international students still living on campus and will remain in the summer um, because they just can't get home. Um, so we're trying our best to accommodate their needs um, and helping them feel safe and secure. Uh, we also um, uh, canceled, uh, postponed graduation. We had a virtual recognition uh, this past weekend when it was scheduled, um, but we will be having a scaled down in-person graduation on homecoming weekend. So we were able to fit that in onto the Sunday part and we had about half the graduates expect interest in doing that. Um, so we do have that, uh, that we're planning. Um, just this week, you know, the, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Just go ahead. this week, we sent out a survey to faculty and staff to kind of get an assessment of their risk tolerance for returning to campus and to identify people who maybe have um, a high risk um, health issue. Um, as well as to open it up for comments, and we've had good feedback for that. I'm sorry, Carol. No, no, that's fine. Thank you, you Christine. I was, I was, I'm actually, this, this theme of sort of graduation and reconfiguring classrooms is one that seems to uh, emerge in every, in every conversation about how we recreate the residential experience. So I'm excited to come back to those, uh, come back to those topics um, in, when, we, when we circle back today. I'd um, like to move on and thank you so much, Christine, for, for, that, uh, for that information to Curtis, Curtis Barker from High Point University. Good morning, You're everyone. On. Good hey. morning. Thank you for being here. No, I appreciate it. It's uh, nice to get into this type of environment and listen to other concerns and expression. It's very interesting to hear the common themes that you know, I heard from everyone prior to it, so I'm not going to repeat all those. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how we handled it. Um, High Point, North Carolina is located in both a hurricane uh, corridor and a tornado area. So about two and a half, three years ago, uh, we implemented a secondary data center and started working on what we would do if we lost our campus due to uh, natural mother nature's uh, fingerprint. So for the last 24 months, we've actually, every nine or 10 months, we've actually gone through exercises where we didn't have the campus, how we would do online classes, how we would do other things, or if the tornado just impacted the main campus. Um, I guess I should have told you. Our campus is a little unique. It's a small private college, about the same size as Brandon School. You know, we have about 5,000, a little bit more. Um, but 97% of our students live on campus. We have very few commuter students. We have about five, six percent of our uh, international students, but it, it's a, um, uh, I know Kelly's been here and some others have, it is a very, very hands-on student-centric uh, university. I always get teased because we have a little uh, ice cream cart that drives around giving away ice cream when it starts getting warm. There's seven to eight little gazebos in the morning that our students can walk past and grab uh, muffins and juice and water and stuff and for breakfast and other things. So it's very student-centric, and that was our big concern when we started looking at 
from a natural disaster perspective, how can we ensure that our students are still provided that, um, we call it the extraordinary experience, but doing it remotely. Um, I, I related a lot to Brandon's comments uh, related to the size and some of the experiences he went through. Uh, we, we looked at it a little differently. We, we are a, um, a Blackboard shop, so we, we consider collaborate our primary environment. We also have Microsoft, but we went ahead and, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, acquired a tertiary environment, and that was WebEx. And WebEx Teams has been extraordinary for us. It's, it's amazing um, what, with, with channels and stuff, what our faculty has been able to do. Faculty has been incredible. I, uh, I'm not a higher ed person. Um, I'm a corporate person. I've only been in higher ed for five years. Still haven't figured out whether I like it or not. Um, it's totally different. But the, um, my biggest apprehension was the faculty, not the students. Students are, are digital already. You know, they're ready for, for that experience. But our faculty, but I, I can say from, we made the announcement we we're extending spring break by a week and then when it was decided they weren't coming back, I could not have asked for a greater group of people to work with. Faculty were, they, they never called demanding, they always called collaborating, they always called with what ifs and can I's. And uh, so we went made it through the rest of the semester. We had our finals. Um, and, and really I can say we, we use ServiceNow. We have a couple of ServiceNow portals with FAQs and tools and tips for our students and our faculty and our staff, both from a technology perspective and from a COVID perspective, and it was just um, very happy. Now, we're going through what everybody else is. We're going through dual exercises of if all students are here, if majority of students are here, but then also how do we do it remotely? Christine mentioned the, um, the video in the classrooms. That's been a big issue for us, Christine. We're trying to figure out what's the best way to do it, you know, looking at A, B, taking a class that's got 25 students and creating A and B, where 12 students would be in class on Monday, and then the other 13 would be in class on Tuesday and splitting it up that way. So that's been the dynamics that we're looking at. How do we come back safely? How do we, if we have to go 100% online, how do we continue it? We're hoping not to do that. I mean, obviously, I'm sure that's everybody's desire, because I, I think a couple of you had mentioned, revenue took a hit, right? Not only re refunds, but also all the activities. Uh, we've already chosen not to do our first summer session, and we have a student advantage session that starts June 26th, so we're hoping that that starts, but revenue is a big issue for us, and obviously for tools for IT, but that's all. Um, I would like to say this is new for me as far as uh, on this group, and Pirelli has been great for me. I'm hoping they're going to share email addresses. I would love for anybody to reach out with me to me with comments and stuff, and also sidebar conversations. But that's about it. How's that, Carol? That was awesome. And you know, I, I the, we we know that the revenue issues are a challenge. We know that the reorg is a challenge. And as I, as uh, you've articulated, what's been the, a common theme across most institutions that I've interacted with is the faculty willingness to make this move quickly, boldly, even with some fear and trepidation. There weren't too many who held back because ultimately we're educators and we're really here for the for the student to make that work. So I'm happy to hear that that was your experience as well, uh, your institution. So thank you, Curtis. Um, and we can certainly facilitate sharing email addresses, and we'll be we'll be happy to do that. Um, David Tool from Carson Newman University. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say about your experience. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is David Tool. Uh, I'm the CIO at Carson Newman University, a private uh, Baptist liberal arts institution in. Uh, East Tennessee, but an hour outside of Knoxville. Um, I've been here nearly 20 years. I'm going on 19 years and uh, uh, worked from, from technician all the way up. But uh, this, as everybody has mentioned, there, there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of different things that we've gone through. Um, uh, you know, seeing all of the changes that, that some of us that have been in higher education for a long time have never come across these things. We'll never hopefully ever see them again, but there is changes that has to happen. <clears throat> we've anticipated changes, we've anticipated problems, but we've never anticipated problems this quick that happen in this way. You know, you think about, uh, as mentioned, you think about the natural disasters and those things, you've got to have contingency plans for those. But a, a fluid and a, a very moving target has, has not been something that, it, that, that good contingency plans are able to, to put up with because 
we're we're making decisions while others are making decisions while the government is making decisions our our local municipalities are making decisions and how do we know what target to hit so not only through the process of of, of when we had to start making the changes but through the process of how we come back those are all things that that all of us are i know are thinking about that are all of us that could be could be struggling with and uh, I, i'll tell you we, uh, I, I'm going to echo what a lot of others have said about the, the things we have had to deal with. Uh, uh, we have probably 75 to 80% on campus. We have some graduate programs, but one of the things like the clinicals, we have that situation, but we also had uh, education placements. We had teachers, we have a large education program and placing teachers into schools where the schools just went away. The primary schools, the K-12 schools just kind of said, we're going online. You got to send your people home. We had similar situations with that to deal with as well. And being a private Baptist institution, and, and most of you, I think everybody on here is a uh, private institution, but we, we're, a, we're very traditional. We have been in a state where we have a lot of faculty and staff who have been here a very long time. Uh, I try not to relate that to people being older and not as familiar with technology, but those challenges happen. Uh, the challenge of not being familiar with technology and trying to push all of our faculty to an online or at least a distance learning option. We tried to make every, every opportunity available to them. We tried to make it so that if they wanted to try to do things through email, I know that's, that's, that's almost worst case scenario for a remote thing, but if you wanted to try to do th things through email, you could do that. Our provost and our, our academic departments and deans said, here's how we can do this. Here's how we have to do this. On top of that, we're in a transition between our LMS. We're in the middle of an LMS transition when all of this happened. And that's, that challenge was already challenging enough, but trying to convince folks who have taught online to then teach on a new platform while being remote, while not being on campus and not being familiar with everything, it, it, it had its own challenges on top of challenges. One of the, our graduation was uh, last Friday. We didn't have it. We are, we are polling our students as to when they want to have it. Homecoming, as Christine mentioned, that was an option that, that we have presented to our students. Also the uh, uh, move-in day for our freshmen next year is also a consideration. You have your seniors who have left coming to meet with the freshmen who are on, incoming and our, our seniors seem to like that day but we're polling our seniors to see, or our graduates now, I guess our graduates now, to see how, what they want their experience to look like. I imagine we'll be in some, some sort of online virtual experience that will supplement an in-person experience. We don't know what that looks like or what day that is now. We also had a very large focus, as many have, get the students through, through the semester. All students try to find ways to make sure they can graduate or they can get through the semester in whatever methods and availabilities that they can. It, it, what I've told my staff and what I've told lots of people is, let's see how much lemonade we can make. You know, let's, let's turn as many lemons into lemonade. We're finding we've had to cancel our camps. We have no online class or we have only online classes for the summer, which we were mostly online for our, a lot of our summer classes. Most of our graduate classes were online, but very few of our traditional classes were. But for the summer, we have that advantage if we were already online. We also have no camps, which that's a revenue hit. But at the same time, if I try to turn this around, it's an opportunity for more time availability to work on some things that we've learned through this, that we had planned to do anyways, and make some changes and opportunities to adjust as necessary. And as with as has been said before, also we had a project, a couple of projects that were in the works. This has triggered that to be something we have to do now. We've double, we've we've added a second ISP, uh, which we only had one ISP. But going into an online environment or a hybrid or an asynchronous or synchronous, whatever we end up doing next semester, a single point of failure that you cannot control at all, and and an option to get a second ISP so that you have some control over that. That was a project we were talking about, we were thinking about, now we're doing it. It is, it is money well spent to get an infrastructure that will in, be in place to better help us through the future and, and the things we need to go through uh, and be prepared for as we change to online and other things. So 
lemon, lemonade, as much lemonade as possible. That's, that's where I try to live and we'll see what we can do. I love that phrase, David. Thank you so much. And thank you to each of you for sharing your experiences. Um, I've been um, watching the, the chat along with Stephen and uh, one of the things that appears to be coming up that I thought maybe I would ask you first as, as technicians is about uh, your experience with moving to um, uh, virtual desktops in various forms. I think it's impressive, Joe, that you were able to get some of your software running on a Raspberry Pi. That just kind of blew my blew my mind a little bit. Um, <laughs> I don't know about my colleagues, uh, but also, you know, we've talked to a lot of schools about moving, uh, if they're Microsoft shops, to moving to Azure uh, for Windows virtual desktops and other things to provide that access. I've heard from some schools about doing Chromebook rollouts with access to CAD software through a virtual desktop. So I'm just curious, uh, really from anybody who's who's on the on the call about your experience with that, and uh, and what you would what you would have to share with your colleagues. Does it work? Does it not work? Carol, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start. We we've had a Citrix environment, uh, hypervisor, and um, uh, back end uh, desktop environment, and we've had that for a while. It's been in limited use. It's been on uh, you know we've had thin clients on campus and things like that. But we quickly turned that around instead of having VPN offerings and offered virtual desktop offerings to our employees by spinning up additional terminal servers, basically, to provide that off-campus experience. We also had to triage who could, who couldn't, as we went slowly into this, but now that we're fully kind of just, we know what, what it, all of it looks like, we're able to apply a lot of that and open up a lot of that to several of our faculty and staff that need to work off campus and access their internal things. So it, it's mm -hmm. been a, a virtual uh, remote session. It's the, the Citrix um, being what remote desktop was originally you know, built on, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Citrix environment has been great for us. Uh, and we use Teams and I've also had a, uh, a hour and a half uh, webinar with Microsoft yesterday, uh, part of our Tennessee consortium. And they, they touted their virtual desktop solution as being able to be run on things like even the Raspberry Pi or other things. So that is mm -hmm. a good option that I've heard. We haven't explored that yet, but it is worth, worth, worth considering, especially if you're a uh, uh, Microsoft shop already or get great discounts through Microsoft as our consortium does in Tennessee. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, we've uh, worked with a lot of folks to help them to be able to get that licensing, whether they were part of the consortium or not, and to, and to support them in those moves. Rob, I wondered if you wanted to, to add anything to that sort of conversation since you're in-house expert on a lot of this. Uh, I would say, here's the thing I would say is the Windows Virtual Desktop works and we've done emergency deployments for folks. And uh, I would say we could get kind of uh, a, you know, uh, an environment similar to VDI rolled out on Azure in uh, you know, in a week or two, uh, as, if you're an Office 365 client, so that right. <laughs> that is a that is a key thing, is that you have your you know, in a lot of the cases and the folks that we worked with, they had a, uh, uh, you know, the Active Directory kind of already synced up with o, o 365 so that was a, that that's a big freebie, <laughs> yeah. if if you're doing yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> So, so the conversations have been so interesting about the specifics of sort of the present moment in dealing dealing with that and certainly the challenges that are known and unknown uh, before us. So curious if anybody would like to uh, talk a little bit about the, the future, sort of what, what we envision for the future um, to the degree that we're able to do that beyond what we've already discussed in terms of classroom reconfigurations and scheduling challenges and, and certainly residence hall uh, challenges are there are there other things we're thinking about the way the work is actually going to change effectively or or will it <laughs> yeah I'd like to jump in there it's all right so yeah, yeah we've please. had uh, a few of those initial task force planning meetings of yeah, what is fall but really what is beyond fall look like to that exact point the LMS we use is called Moodle and we're moving to an external host um, called Munani actually this month, which is great because we have a lot of uh, technical debt over the last 10 years, which we're trying to realize. And part of that has enabled us to like, it is now we're, te we're, we're changing the way that the faculty are constructing content. And this is a big shift right now. Many of them, you know, they would come in, present, and they would, you know, record their lectures as others have said. Well, now we're like, okay, of the three scenarios that look like, you know, 
mostly open on campus or fully online or no, you start open on campus, but then another thing happens and you got to shift and pivot like we did here in spring back to kind of a, an all online approach. So we're asking our instructors and faculty teach modular. In other words, you know, week ones and two have it in this core week three and four have it in this core. And that way, if we do have to pivot in the middle of this and move forward again, your stuff can be easily shifted and put back online or we can move back in that modality. And we're also requiring just every course now, consider what does it look like if you have to teach this fully online? That, that never used to be a thought. We're not in Tornado Alley, we're in the Pacific Northwest, at most we get an earthquake. And so it wasn't in our thought process. It's like, oh, disaster recovery, business continuity, yeah, we'll get there eventually. I mean, Kelly you know, and Kimberly know what I'm talking about. They were out here a couple of months ago. So it's a big deal to change that and turn that around and have them change the way they're thinking about how they're presenting this concept. So we are seeing that as a permanent change and how they are delivering the content. And I come from the corporate world and faculty content and the campus experience is the product we're selling to attract our students. So changing your product delivery <laughs> is, is a big deal for us because like others have mentioned, being on campus or receiving that face-to-face -face interaction is what they're paying for. So how do you maintain that quality? So that's the other big thing is how do we keep this culture? And that's where we'll spend a lot of time over the summer months is how do we maintain the culture for the students that expectancy, you know, to really, you know, keep the customer happy uh, through these very trying times because we're expecting we're going to have some revenue decline come in fall. And we're not going to have this heavy enrollment and that's going to affect and impact what we choose to move forward with and what we don't. So that's, that's kind of the big focus for us is how do we change and uh, adjust the culture of the teaching methodology. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Yeah, I think, I think it's not only culture. It's also if we're, if we're moving to more digital, uh, if we're moving to a more digital environment, let's look at all of our processes. Let's look at all of what the student sees. If they're going to be doing things more online, then then our online presence and and we're in a we're in a uh, a migration to to help the students see a better experience and uh, of course uh, not to necessarily plug but Forelli's helping us with those things because moving to a better experience for the student digitally since we're we're going to be forced or force them or however whoever tells us we have to do what those students need to see the best experience they possibly can. So however we can make that happen, however we can make that work, and anything we can do to make it feel more comfortable, more current, a lot of our stuff is older, visually older, whatever we can do, we need to try to be thinking about those things because their experience is going to be different. Yeah. I would also say that I'm I'm 100% optimistic about the future. I think that uh, a lot of the 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 fissures in higher ed were already there, whether it was the decline in the demographics that we were starting to head into, the decline in you know potential decline in international enrollment. Something was going to change anyway, um, and I don't think anybody wanted a pandemic to prove that point. But we were headed down this road anyway to look at new forms of education. Um, and I think the, the exciting thing for us is that um, although we'll always preserve the, the premium brand that is, that is Pratt, this is an opportunity for us to attract and be able to educate more folks. Um, I think you've got to go where the learners are, and this is a good situation where we can do that. We're developing these tools. It's not just an interstitial thing. It's got to be something more enduring than that. Um, and if you really believe in higher education, it shouldn't be a privileged thing. And I think this is an opportunity for technology to, to play that role. We've had that capability all along. It's just that there's never been as much of a, uh, a, a you know, a clear call to make that happen. So I think it's, for us, it's looking at new products. We're developing new products right now um, that will be put out in a micro-credentialed way with a, a blockchain backbone, um, just-in-time learning, learning for uh, non-traditional groups. You know, if you uh, teach somebody uh, some of the things that we're offering, it's the difference between $14 an hour and $22 an hour. That's like 
you know, the difference between walking and being on a motorcycle. Um, so I think we have to look at this as a, a moment where it's not as much of the, the haves and have nots. Even with 4,500 colleges and universities around the country, that's still not enough education to go around. So I think this is uh, a reckoning, but it's a really good reckoning, and um, we're, we're enthusiastic about it. Appreciate your optimism, Joe. Some days it's hard to hard to capture that and stick with it as we as we understand the challenges. But I, I tend to agree with you. This is, you know, in in some in some industries we might say this is an, a forced right sizing in some ways, <laughs> in re in reallocation. I'm not sure what you know what I think about that. Other than the only thing I know for sure is we're not going back to what we were before. That that seems pretty pretty evident to me. So I'd like to open it up to the floor for anybody. I know there's been some conversation in the chat about free licenses and yeah. how we handle handle that. I don't know if anybody wants to comment on, on you know, how we respond to, we, we used it for six months, everybody loves it, and now we've got to pay, and what's that look like? Or the security challenges that we might have overlooked in the short-term rush to, uh, to move to uh, online learning and, and adjusting with those. So uh, I'll just see if anybody has anything they'd like to say about those topics, and then we'll be ready to wrap up after, shortly after that. Okay. Well, I, okay. I, I've, Go ahead. I've to take a very cautious approach on those free things, and 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 I know you, uh, uh, Carolyn, mentioned in the in the comments and in, in the chat. I, I agree. We, we we've got to be cautious about these things because it is a. a yeah, I hate to say it, but it's a, here's the taste. Now you're hooked. And our constituents, us in technology understand a lot of that is, is cautious, but our constituents don't always. And the momentum that can be created behind these free offers can be something we, or should be something we are prepared from a technical standpoint to address in our institutions because it could get a lot of momentum where we know better that it might not. In some instances, it might be the right solution, but in some instances, it's very the wrong solution. Um, and so I, I just say we, we should all proceed with caution. The security aspect of things, as, as everybody is fully aware, Zoom themselves had to make a ton of changes from security because of the increase in use um, I, I also say that the free options are also turning other things much more expensive. So, I, you know, I, I used the example to a colleague the other day. They were like, well, we just need to buy a whole bunch of webcams. Go try to find a webcam that used to be $30 and try to pay anything less than $150 for it. Right. I just got a quote from Logitech. They're a two-month lead time on their webcams. Yeah. So, all of these free services have created a supply and demand issue as well. When those go away, some of those prices will come down, but some of them won't because the demand will always be there as we've discussed. This is a change that may persist. Yeah. I've tried to get ahead of that a little bit um, by emphasizing that we have a lot of tools already uh, especially with Office 365 and Microsoft that we're already paying for. Um, and that rings a bell with the president's cabinet because we're extremely budget conscious. I mean, we've had to do layoffs and cuts and all those things. So um, I'm really trying to be an advocate for that and, and still learning a lot of things because we hadn't fully um, gone through our team's adoption. And so sure we got into some of those discussions with the admissions folks so well we want zoom and i'm like but we have team meetings and but we're discovering some other um benefits for example there's something with uh office 365 called bookings you know advising was wanting something that they could post um admissions two years ago had gone out and paid a heavy price for something that they have and you know the advising team said we looked at that and that was so complicated and so just really trying to be aware of what functionality you have as part of your existing packages and really being an advocate um, for that uh, with people when they come to you before ideally before they come to you with, I found this great tool um, now that being said um, one thing that we probably are going to go ahead and buy um, was the respondus we were already a respondus user so we um, 
we had a limited number of licenses. We got the free ones. We're going to uh, go ahead and upgrade to the unlimited. Um, it wasn't a big spend, but it's one that makes sense for us um, because of some of the regulations for um, right. test monitoring, especially with our PA program. So that one right. was worth it, and it's not a high ticket item. So um, thank you so much, everybody, for your comments and for your thoughtfulness uh, as, we've got, as we've worked through this hour. Um, I know we're at the top of the hour, and I want to be respectful of your time. I will be uh, hanging out here, as will some of my colleagues, if people want to continue the conversation. But I wanted to be sure to say thank you to all of the panelists who shared their insights and their inspiration, I have to say. And, uh, and uh, we really look forward to continuing um, these conversations uh, going forward. Really appreciate it. And um, like I said, I'll hang out. We could have as many conversations as people would like, but uh, wanted to be respectful of your time. Stephen, was there anything that I missed or anything you'd like to add? No, thank you for everyone who joined. As I said, we will be sending out um, documentation, uh, recording of the video. Um, and uh, as I, I believe uh, Curtis pointed to earlier, definitely making connections and being able to share some of the uh, panelists' information so further dialogue can happen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you guys for doing this. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. Great to get to know you a little bit.